If you've looked inside my latest book of Sheaves and Stars, you'll notice that the book is divided into sections, the archers, the branches, the iron, and the harvest. And while these sections provide structure for the story and they sort of help to sketch Joseph's character arc, they aren't just a cool way to outline the book. They actually follow Jacob's prophecy over Joseph in Genesis and David's prophetic insight into his life in Psalm 105. Now there's a bit of a spoiler here, but in Genesis 49, when Joseph's father Jacob is dying, he blesses all his sons and look what he says about Joseph. This is Genesis 49, 22 and the verses following. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a spring. His branches run over the wall. The archers bitterly attacked him, shot at him and harassed him severely, yet his bow remained unmoved. His arms were made agile by the hands of the mighty one of Jacob, the shepherd, the stone of Israel, by the God of your father who will help you, by the Almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that crouches beneath, blessings of the breasts and the womb. The blessings of your father are mighty beyond the blessings of my parents, up to the bounties of the everlasting hills. May they be on the head of Joseph, on the brow of him who was set apart from his brothers. Isn't that beautiful? And there's even more if we, I mean, doesn't that sound just like Joseph's life? But if we jump over several books later in the Bible into Psalms 105, which is penned by King David, who I've also written about, we're given some heart-wrenching insight into what Joseph suffered. So if we go into Psalms, several of which King David wrote, we can go to Psalms 105 starting in verse 16. When God summoned a famine on the land and broke all supply of bread, he had sent a man ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. His feet were hurt with fetters. His neck was put in a collar of iron. Until what he had said came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. And that is heart-wrenching. But God was speaking through David, through the Holy Spirit. The Bible is inspired by God. And so what he was receiving was prophetic insight about what Joseph suffered. So I used all of these verses as the framework for my book because they already speak to the heart of Joseph's story, what God wanted us to see, thus providing prophetic insight into our stories as well, because the ultimate meaning of this whole thing is the life we can take hold of when we surrender to God's big picture perspective over our narrow one. In part one, The Archers, Joseph is betrayed by his brothers, and once he learns there's no escape from that betrayal, he chooses to stand on the foundation that was laid in his life when he first gave himself over to God and received dreams. In part two, The Branches, Joseph is learning to see God's hand on his life moving in the lives of others in Egypt, which is a revolutionary concept to him. You know, God moving in a place that he didn't want to be. However, in the midst of this growing in favor and stature, he's crafting his own script of how God should use all this to rescue him, a plan that falls apart in part three, the iron, where Joseph suffers even worse and must learn to really truly surrender all of his plans, even his hopes for release. Finally, in part four, the harvest, Joseph is exalted and strangely content with that, not really interested in reconciling with his family, wishing that, you know, he could wishing he could while figuring that it's impossible, but God blows his expectations out of the water, allowing him an opportunity to see redemption where he didn't think it was possible. Now, let's jump over to Deuteronomy, which was written, I think, by Moses. So this is before the death of Moses, before leadership of Israel was transferred over to Joshua. Moses is going back with the people over their history, and this is what he says of Joseph. He reminds us of the blessings that God gave Joseph. Deuteronomy 33, 13. And of Joseph, he said, Blessed by the Lord be his land, with the choicest gifts of heaven above and of the deep that crouches beneath, with the choicest fruits of the sun and the rich yield of the months, with the finest produce of the ancient mountains and the abundance of the everlasting hills, with the best gifts of the earth and its fullness, and the favor of him who dwells in the bush. May these rest on the head of Joseph, on the brow of him who is a prince among his brothers. Now look at what all of those, I would have to do more research on this, but look at what each of those blessings seems to represent. 
blessed by the Lord be his land. Typically in the Bible, your land is not just the physical land, but also what you are given by God, what you have jurisdiction over. Joseph was blessed with the choicest gifts of heaven above and the deep that crouches beneath. So Joseph experienced the heights and the depths and was blessed by God in both places. The choicest fruits of the sun and the rich yield of the months, that could be, you know, the, the actual land, the seasons, the, the rich yield of the seasons in the midst of famine, Joseph prospered. The produce of the ancient mountains and the abundance of the everlasting hills, that could be blessings of the past and blessings of the future. The gifts of the earth and its fullness and the favor of him who dwells in the bush. Moses met God in the burning bush. Maybe he's referring to that here, that Joseph was blessed with earthly gifts and spiritual gifts as well. God lifted him up as a prince among his brothers. And this is something that is just so profound to me, and I could not have chosen a better way to structure my book because it's already in scripture. It's already God reaching out to us and saying, take a hint, this is what the story is about. I highly doubt in the midst of Joseph's sufferings that he ever fully grasped the intensity of the blessings God wanted to give him and how far they would go. Not just in the midst of his trauma and his crisis moments, but just in the daily grind of just waking up every day, yet another day not being rescued, not seeing what he wanted to see. And how many of us find ourselves in similar places. And yet our story, just like Joseph's, it's all about the life that we can have when we embrace God's perspective over our own. So as we get up every day into lives that we don't recognize or, or don't like perhaps parts of it or can't imagine why we're here, the best thing to do is to remember the abundance of our God. And Joseph's story is a great reminder of this because, you know, I, I look at Joseph's story as such an example because I have not gone through anything like what he went through. And if God can give such blessings, such immense blessings over such horrible pain and just a disaster of a life, then he, what can he do with me? And my biggest fascination is the, the whole reason I do this is because we serve the same God who has actually made a way for all of us, even those of us who are not of Israel, to be brought into the relationship with him that I talk about in this book, the covenant of the heart that will change us all forever. So I encourage you as you read through the book and watch how Joseph's character arc follows these sections, remember that God came up with that part, not me.